They probably did. <laughs> this week on Quality <laughs> Digest Live, we helped we the U.S. <laughs> Metric Association celebrate its 100th anniversary. I bet you didn't know that we had a metric association. Uh, we do. Okay, plus, how to better connect with customers. That and more when we come back. <laughs> And welcome back to Quality Digest Live for November 4th, 2016. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. That he is, and I am Quality Digest publisher Mike Richmond. Well, one of the things that we hear a lot these days, uh, Dirk, we talk about it all the time, we've heard yep. about it, is that there's a, a dearth of good job opportunities in industry. And the conventional wisdom seems to be that outside of you know, highly specialized skills that are always in demand for a relatively small number of jobs, take welding, for example, uh, there's just aren't really many new jobs being created by the economy. Uh, and much of this is driven by technological changes that tend to reduce the reliance on labor, even if they increase productivity, of course. But in the article, Creating a Smart, Skilled Cybersecurity Workforce, which ran in yesterday's issue of Quality Digest Daily, author Rodney Peterson points to findings that 1.5 million additional cybersecurity professionals are going to be needed by industry worldwide within the next four years. 1.5 million? 1.5 million new cybersecurity oh. jobs across the world. Across the oh, world. Oh, across I, the world. Okay. Yeah, I actually okay. misread it the first time and thought it was only in the U.S. <laughs> like, wow. But it's, it's across the world uh, between now and 2020. Peterson would be in a position to know. He's the director of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education at NIST, and he has an extensive background in both cybersecurity and higher education. In this article, Peterson points to the work that his organization, which is known by its acronym, NICE, N-I-C-E, -E, is doing to foster and develop cybersecurity training and opportunities. <coughs> Excuse me. For instance, did you know that October was National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, but I do now, thanks to Peterson's article. His organization, NICE, is also in the process of updating a workforce framework that identifies the specific knowledge, skills, and abilities needed to work in cybersecurity. But wait, there's more, a lot more. NICE also supported the recent National K-12 Cybersecurity Education Conference. They formed a working group to explore cybersecurity concepts, strategies, and actions. They offer e-newsletters, webinars, and expos on the topic, and they're spearheading a regional partnership program to tie in schools, community colleges, universities, training organizations, employers, and local governments. A K through 12? K through 12, that's right, yep. K through 12, Teaching. probably more through the 12 <laughs> element of that, but it, you know. Teaching kindergartners how to hack. How, how, to, <laughs> how, how to prevent hacks, that's very, okay. very important. How to protect your, protect your information. Now all this activity is intended to promote, of course, the importance of cybersecurity and open the eyes of first companies to understand that they need to allocate resources to this area, and, and secondly, to individuals to make them see the employment opportunities that are there. To further this latter matchmaking effort between organizations and individuals, NICE is launching yet another effort, this one known as their Cybersecurity Job Heat Map, which will allow companies to find cybersecurity job candidates and individuals to see what companies are looking for to fill those positions. You know, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot going on with this organization and the entire cybersecurity field, really. So if you want more information on NICE, I think you should really check out Rodney Peterson's article. It's just below the video player screen right down there. A lot of information in that article, a lot of links. There's some interesting infographics in that, that article as well. Um, there's a lot going on here, and I think that the core message really is that there's jobs here. There's jobs here for, for people that have technical experience uh, and understand understand the, the nature and want to understand the nature of cybersecurity and why it's important to industry. And that's a good message. 1.5 million jobs worldwide yeah. between now and 2020 is significant. And I think that, you know, in America especially, there's a lot of call for that uh, as we've seen. So it's an important thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm still stuck on that. The K through 12. K through 12, yes. Conference. Kindergartners wow. to protect your information. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, this year, 2016, marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the U.S. Metric Association, the USMA. I didn't even know we had a metric Not association. Me, me neither. Learned, uh, learned a couple yeah. things this week. There you go. Well, <laughs> USMA's mission is to help the United States complete its transition, complete its transition, yep. its transition 
Ongoing. Ongoing to the metric system. <laughs> I bet you didn't even know we were transitioning to the metric system, did you? Well, it's been 100 years in the making, so you can see how successful it's been. It's, remember it's, the metric <laughs> gas pump? I don't know if you remember. Do you remember the metric gas pumps? Were you? I, I kind of it was, do. It was in the leaders, 80s where yeah. they changed the gas. Uh, yeah. and everybody was like, <gasps> what is this? The horror. <laughs> <laughs> like, how much am I paying for gas? I can't tell. I need, a, I need a, how many liters? <laughs> what? <laughs> OK. Now, the crazy thing about metric in the US, according to USMA President Donald Hilger, in his article, Under the Hood, were metric is that in the early 1980s, uh, former British Commonwealth countries, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it, Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand, South Africa, and so, so forth, met their schedules and deadlines for a national metric change. But not the US, I mean, they did it, but we just kind of like, like I said, in the 80s, we tried this and we ju it just kind of floundered. And Hilger, Hilger believes that the problem at the time was that the U.S. just didn't, they didn't go all in. They didn't just go cold turkey, we're going to do this and let's just get it done. From a public perspective, we kind of dipped our toes into it, but we didn't really push it. And so, you know, here we are 30 years later, 40 years later, and we're still... Tripping over our feet. Still tripping over, yes. <laughs> there we go, <laughs> tripping over our feet. I just thought of that. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> but here, here's the big but, as, as, as Hilger writes, uh, big butt, <laughs> big butt. <laughs> he said big butt, uh, metric usage in the United States is more common actually than people realize, even if you don't use it. I mean, if you think of, mm. you know, automobiles and machinery and most everything in the medical field from equipment to, you know, pharmaceutical doses. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you also consider that pretty much every imported item is made where metric is the standard, then you understand that metric is in fact everywhere, including in the United States. I mean, most modern Modern American cars, we're talking American cars, are a mix of metric and standard, uh, standard fasteners, if you think about it. So sometimes even more metric than standard, depending on the make. And this is why Hilger says that in the United States, metric is under the hood. If you've ever worked on your car, you know, you got to have a set of metric wrenches yeah. and, and standard wrenches, even if you own a Ford F-150, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's a mix. It's not just all SAE standards. Well, Hilger wants to bring metric out of the shadows. He wants us to stop converting, which is what most people do when they think of metric. Let's see, let's see, one inches, uh, whatever, 25 inches. Okay. Uh, and he wants us to start conversing in metric. We need to begin using metric in the way that metric countries do. For example, on road signs and weather reports and at the grocery store says Hilger. Now keep in mind that Hilger is president of the US Metric Association, so he's got you know, a particular perspective on this. But really, why not? Why not go metric and join the rest of the world? Why are we in the United States so reticent, reticent to that particular change? Well, if you Google, why isn't the US metric, you will get an earful. I mean, there's a lot of conversation on there. And, but, and really, if you look at what most of the, the, the people who are against it, it really comes down to why. We're used to the standard system. It works for us, we convert units if we need to, and there doesn't appear to be a cost motive for doing, you know, for changing, so why do it? And a pretty good synopsis, actually a really good synopsis of that is in a, in a rather lengthy comment by D.K. Hayes underneath the story, and, and you can check out, if you go to our, our player page and click out to the story, mm -hmm. he leaves a really good comment, which kind of is the synopsis for why a lot of people are just saying, you know, why bother? Why bother? Yep. Leave your own thoughts in that comment section, by the way. And here's the question. Should we force the U.S. kicking and screaming into the metric world or not? And by the way, Bill Levinson, if you're watching this, <laughs> Bill, Bill Levinson is both a columnist and he watches our show all the time. I think this is an awesome yes. topic for a column. Do you force your customers, in this case the customers being U.S. citizens, Consumers, yeah. do you force them to use a standard which they really say no need for, yeah. even if it is basically the global standard of, of measurement is metric, not SAE. So yeah, well, it's a good question. It, 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 it comes down to a not made here, which is what we hear all the time right, right, with right. In, in individual organizations. Like they don't want to adopt lean or yeah. whatever, Baldridge, because it's not made here. We didn't come yeah. up with, with the idea, so it's right. not our, our individual culture of it. Right. So without our culture being involved in the in the design of this thing, it's not going to be adapted by our, our rank and file. Yeah, and which, that is actually, that is one of the arguments which is also. It's an argument, yeah. but I mean, yeah. it, you know, it, hey, we're all people. We can we can change our, our, we can shift our minds, right? 
right? I mean, yeah. and, but like you said, I mean, and like like that article mentioned, there there is a lot of penetration of metric into the market too. I mean, you, you know, you buy your soda in liters. I mean, yeah, that's, you know, which I strangely mean, enough, yes, sure. you buy your I mean, soda in liters. Yeah, you know, it's it's, yeah. it's the way it is, and and uh, you know, it's 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 kind of funny though. You buy your milk in gallons and your soda <laughs> and your soda in liters. Soda in liters. <laughs> it's kind of weird. I didn't think about that before, but in yeah. any event, I mean, that's that's and the way it goes. And your liquor in fifths. So. Okay. <laughs> well, that's li that's a, li that's a, a fifth of a liter. There you go, right? Two hundred milliliters. In any event, that's a great story. So check that one out again under the player page. And yeah, leave your comments. Leave your comments on all of our stories. We always like to hear from our, our viewers and our readers on stuff that we're, we're covering. All right, well, comment on this one too, because this is another good article. Because uh, on the show, um, and in our newsletter, Quality Digest Daily, and, and throughout our site, I would wager that few, if any, phrases have been repeated more often in 2016 than the phrase big data. What would you think, Dirk? Uh, Internet of Things maybe would be up there, but big data. Millennial. Millennials. <laughs> big data is probably yeah. just about our most our most used term. And, and it makes sense because industry in general and, and the quality function specifically have come to understand in recent years that, that capturing and mining and interpreting ever larger chunks of information on, on topics like customer behaviors and preferences, it's really the key to increase success, which is usually translated as greater market share and, and higher revenues. Right? That's how most people translate success. Uh, however, in her article, Trend Prediction, Connections with Customers Matter, which ran in Monday's issue of Quality Digest Daily, author Barbara Cleary introduces me and, and maybe some of you to a newer term that can help achieve the same worthy goals of higher revenues and more efficiency, small data. Small data, yeah. Small data, little data pieces. And what Cleary's talking about here is the, it's kind of the secret sauce that makes any company succeed and that's the ability to foster positive customer experiences. Large and even many medium-sized companies often generate millions upon millions of customer experiences each and every year. And that mountain of collective experience when looked at in the abstract as a single entity represents exactly what we're talking about when we use the term big data, right? But Cleary's point is that these don't represent a single humongous monolithic entity. All of those experiences and touch points broken down to their component parts represent almost infinitesimally small bits of data. And it's here where company representatives engage with customers or potential customers that the ultimate success or failure of an organization is really going to be measured is in, is in the exchange, is not all this data, right. but the little pieces of data that, that compi comprise that, that big data, right? So Cleary's article points out that these data, which are all about making connections, can be incredibly difficult to quantify. The allure of big data in part is that by conglomerating lots of experiences into a single whole, granularities can start to emerge that in theory can drive corporate strategy. But if you have a million customers, let's say you have a million customers and you know that a certain strategy is gonna satisfy 75% of them, that's great, that's awesome, that's a great strategy, but do you really wanna leave 250,000 potential customers sitting on the sidelines, right? I mean, why would you want to do right. that? Just because the, the mass wants it, there's these little pieces on the sides that may not want that. Well, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to use the power of small data or personal interaction to satisfy them too. And that's what she's talking about here. And, and this is where having team members who understand psychology and the emotional side of business excellence proves so important. Customer-facing employees need to have their EQ to hear and understand and empathize with their customers' pain points in real time. Um, and more important, they need to really be empowered to solve problems because through their personal interactions with those customers, those employees know best what needs to be done. And the perfect example of that always was Ritz Carlton, right? We've heard about right. Ritz Carlton having the ability for anybody in the organization to have a chunk of change they can use to make a problem go away for yeah. a customer. And they're empowered to do it because they've trained their people properly to know to use good judgment. So the individual mind. customer interaction, the, co the, the, the company as a whole may look at, at you know, how should our hotels be designed right. and how should customer service be designed, but at the, at the, at the customer level, they give them the ability to, to make changes. Where the rubber meets the road. And yeah. If they're trained properly, they can make those good decisions. That's yeah. the key thing, it's that they're trained properly. Well, this is really just going to the gamba, if you think about it, in a sense, uh, the place where the action happens, where the work is performed, uh, and, and it's often on the phone or it's through chat functions or sometimes it's face-to-face -face across the counter. Some people have a talent for remaining calm and empathizing and, and problem solving, and, and these things can be trained to a certain extent, but again, some people just have that knack for handling situations with grace, and, and again, it just comes down to emotional intelligence, what we, of course, call EQ, as I mentioned earlier. Um, there's one other important thing here. To do small data right, you can't ever assume 
anything. I mean, Cleary uses a great example about Lego. We all love Lego, we're all mm -hmm. fans of Lego. Uh, a few years back, the company made the assumption that their customers, kids, were suffering from declining attention spans due to you know, ever-increasing digital entertainment. So they made the decision to focus their sales on bigger blocks, which in theory could be assembled more quickly by their supposedly impulsive and impatient customer base. Well, you know what happened? I think you can guess what happened. Lego sales plummeted, they went down. It wasn't until the company actually began engaging with kids and watching them play and talking to them about what they really liked and didn't like that they realized that their customers, the kids, really liked the results from putting in some mm. effort to build something. The, the result of getting something that they had to work for a little bit. Lego had inadvertently dumbed down their product to the point where their target audience was no longer valuing its unique properties. And big data on hundreds of millions of kids across the world said one thing, that right. kids' attention spans are lowering and they're doing digital stuff and you need bigger blocks because that's the way we're gonna use our product to, to, to attach to them. But small data on a handful really closely engaged with customers says something entirely differently. And, and of course, once the company focused again on the small blocks, their sales went back up, up, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the key thing here is that, you know, you can't focus too much on big data. Big data is valuable, it's invaluable, and if you know how to interpret it and, and dive into it and mine it, you're gonna get some great insights. But don't forget that the people that are dealing with your customers and personal interaction with your customers itself really reveals a lot of information too, and that small data combined with the big data can be really, really powerful and valuable. Yeah. And yeah. I think that, that's, it's, yeah, it, you can't you know, it, that. Like, as we always say, it always boils down to the individual customer. It, it does, you it can't does. Treat them, you can't treat them as a humongous blob. Well, yeah. and the thing is, big data lets you do that. If, if you yeah. understand the, this principle she's talking about here, you can have the big data and have the, the big trends, and then you can also peer into it by having a, a, an insight into your customers through your, yep. your, your people to help you understand what they're doing. So it's, yep. it's good stuff there by Barbara. Good stuff, Clark. all right. Check that one out. All right, well, we're going to move on now, because so, once again, it's time for uh, our, our Tech Corner segment. This is Dirk's favorite part of the show, when he gets a chance to, uh, to geek out, as he likes to say, on new equipment or software sent to us by test equipment manufacturers from around the world. Once again, joining us in the studio with Dirk is Rob Bellinger of Olympus, who is going to show us the BMX53M microscope, along with the Olympus Stream software. So take it away, guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cameras over there. <laughs> thanks, Mike. Yeah, once again, we have Rob Bellinger with us from Olympus. Yeah, Rob, thanks. See you again, Dirk. And uh, so, tell us about this microscope that you got here with us. So, we brought in the uh, new model BX53M. It's our upright uh, metallurgical compound microscope. And I w we're showing a little more of the integration to our Olympus Stream software today. So, this integration is going to focus on the uh, added encoded Z module to the microscope. Just a manual microscope with an encoded Z now, we can track all the changes you do in focus. Okay. And the software is able to capture the, all the focus data, create height maps, 3D images, and we'll go through and show a little bit of that. Okay, sure, let's see it. So, typically, you know, looking at circuitry or any kind of devices, you want to get small height measurements, you need higher magnifications. Uh, to get the resolution, but that higher magnification means lower depth of focus. So you can see on the screen, as I change focus, it's got several layers of focus. Okay. Our software has always been able to create an extended focal image. The stream software's had the ability to create one in focused image, which is great. And this function we call instant EFI, just manually changing the focus. But with the integration of the encoded Z now, when we perform this instant EFI, we're able to quickly roll through focus. So you're manually, you're just manually, manually rolling changing. through the focus yeah. uh, up and down. Okay. I go from top to bottom, and it creates an all-in-focused image for me. So let me let me let me see if I understand this. So you're man as you, as you're manually racking it through the focus, it, it's capturing the pixels that are in focus and throwing away the rest, and then stitching it all together at the end. So you've got a completely in focus top to bottom image, is I, exactly, I have that right? Yep, that's exactly how our extended focal image is working. It's capturing only the most focused pixels. And the added a uh, capability here now is it's also tracking the Z position very accurately with okay. an encoder. So all of those pixels are now mapped in height and it creates a height map to the image as well. So that height map will now let us take the software and render three dimensional images. Okay, so that's that 3D image uh, yep, that we 3D just captured. Image okay. of a little, uh, uh, gold uh, circuit connection pad. Right. So you might need to know if it's at the same level as the printed circuit board and how high it is off the surface. So rendering a 3D image lets you see you know, surface topography very well. And then we can move on to um, processing this image. 
And a new feature in the stream software is our 3D profile measurements. So by striking a line profile across the sample here, you can do X or Y or arbitrary points. It plots a height map across that line profile. Oh, in the lower part of the screen yeah, down there. In the lower okay. part of the screen. And in this height map, we can now take 3D line uh, profile height measurements. So you can select your first point, you know, maybe a top point of the gold, and you want to know the height down to the bottom surface of the board. It can give you that information, 215 okay. micrometers. So this is quick and easy for rendering 3D profile data, getting very reproducible and uh, accurate Z height data because in the past, we used to have to just guess where we were placing the points. Now we see a profile line, okay. and we can place the points exactly on a step that we want it to be marked at. And along with the 3D imaging, this can all be sent out to a report, nice 3D picture, 2D image showing a height profile, and you save all this data out. Okay. So great for quality assurance, uh, checking your quality of you know, your points on all kinds of different materials for height, but also for maybe a uh, defect review, something that's broke, you need to know there was a change in a position of a part on the surface of something you're manufacturing. If something wasn't as high as it was supposed to be, making a bad connection okay. to other components. So this is, this is basically a, a dimensional <coughs> measurement tool, really. With the added Z, it can be, and the Z encoded, it can be in dimensional measurement for Z, that's okay. for sure. Um, also, great imaging tool for you know, creating all in focus and three-dimensional viewing. Um, you have to have the height data there to get a good three-dimensional map of an image. Now, that, 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 um, that extended focal range, mm -hmm. is that what you go, would, would you? Extended focal imaging. Uh, yeah. extended, that yeah, was but, something that was, that we've seen in the past, but only yeah. on your motorized, uh, only on your motorized systems, right? So this Correct. is the first time you guys have done it on a, on a manual system? So yes, this is the first time it's been integrated to our upright compound scope with just an encoded. So you can still just have a manual focus. You quickly can scroll through your focus to capture the data. You don't have to have the added cost or the added uh, you know, f complexity of the motorization well, attached I, to the system. I was gonna, I was gonna say, so that must mean, <clears throat> since this is basically pretty much a manual microscope, um, right. that means that the, the price point on it is gonna be much less than if you got a full on, uh, you know, completely motorized system, but you yeah. still have a lot of the, uh, uh, be able to do a lot of the things that you can do on a motorized system. Correct, yeah, so, you know, the, if you were doing a lot of these height maps over 100 points, it'd be cost effective to go with the motorization and let it right. do it completely automatically, drive to those points, grab the images all in stitch together, and you just hit a button and let the work be done by the scope. But right. if you're doing quick measurements on a single point, and you're moving samples in and out, just having a manual system is great. You just scroll through the focus, gather all your height data. So yeah, it saves cost. It's, it's a balance between workload too, you know. Okay. Olympus has the fully motorized systems, you know, laser autofocusing if you need it, and uh, can automate a lot more of the functions, but this is meant, meant for more of a manual setup. What, what's what's the, the, the accuracy and uh, resolution? I know it's going to depend sure. on probably on the head you're using, but yeah, it's definitely lens, de yeah. yeah, dependent on the resolution of the lens. So your higher resolution lens is um, going to be higher magnification typically as well. They can resolve about a micron of Z height because it's not. A confocal system is still looking sure, at yeah, reflected yeah, light, right, so yeah. there's some sample dependency here too in reflections and non-reflective samples, but on most cases, about a micron of Z accuracy in the higher mag ranges. Okay. Um, any of the other uh, any of the other features that are available typically in, in stream um, on your your fully automated things that people might be able to use on on, on this microscope? Absolutely. So if, if you do have the fully automated focus and motorized staging as well, the stream software can plot this information and stitch together large fields of view as well. Okay. So it could go to... So the stitching know, is something that you'd be able to do if you had an, an added uh, motorized, system motorized system and okay. motorized Z. You would actually yeah. tell the software, plot out this region. It maybe needs to take 100 pictures to do it, but it would go to all those individual slots of... Uh, fields of view and stitch together all the Z, move to the next one, do that all automated. So okay. that's the next step up if you have to and capture. Who, who do you see, what, what audience do you see mostly interested in, in this type of uh, manual system, smaller Absolutely. system like this? So the BX is metallurgical microscope. You're gonna see it from, like I have here, printed circuitry to medical device to me metals and metal manufacturing, uh, part connections. Um, wiring connections, wiring harnesses. Kind of, kind of where you're going to be doing manual uh, manual inspection and you just need a, a, a lower cost. High, uh, yeah, higher resolution, manual inspection, 
Um, so definitely in your quality departments, your failure analysis departments, um, they're going to be looking at you know, systems like this that are quick inspections. Okay, great. Yeah. And I, I think we said the part number, this is the BX. This is the new BX53M series. I think we called it BXM, sorry about that. No, BX53M. BX53M. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, Rob, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Back to you, Mike. Well, there you have it. Yes, as I mentioned, uh, uh, accidentally, uh, but that is the, the BX. <laughs> Uh, you can see it right there, the BX53M uh, industrial microscope along with the, uh, the Olympus Stream software. Uh, great demo there, Dirk, and yeah. uh, good job yeah. uh, by, again, by Rob Bellinger. Always have Rob, Rob's local to us. He's not yeah, yeah, far he away doesn't have us, that so far to drive. Thanks come down and do this for us, so thank you, Rob. All right, we're going to close the show almost uh, today with our Tweet of the Week, and this one comes to us from uh, the Event Fire Solutions tweeter, uh, tweet account, who say, crazy clowns terrorizing the streets and a crazy power mad billionaire about to become president. It can only mean one thing, Dirk. Do you know what that is? We need Batman. That's right. <laughs> That's right. We need Batman. I, I couldn't agree more, especially about the clowns. But, uh, you know, if you need superhero level advice in 140 characters or less on quality management methodologies and, and uh, overcoming political terrors, I urge you to check us out on Twitter. As always, at Quality <laughs> Digest. Well, on that note, I think we yeah we have a couple of minutes here, Dirk. Yeah, so on, on that note, I I, uh, I I wanted to say something. Kind of let me get my uh, my soapbox out. Oh of boy, where's um, the I I uh, you know. All of us out there in the audience, all of you out there, may not know this, but there's actually an election coming up <laughs> on Tuesday. I know it's yes. probably gone under the radar for a lot of you who, who don't live uh, above ground. But anyway, um, yeah, it's, there's an election coming up on Tuesday, as we all know. Um, and I don't want to uh, get up on my soapbox and say who you should vote for. That would be totally inappropriate for me to say that anyone should vote for either of the candidates or any of the candidates that are, are involved in, in this election. Uh, I did want to say a couple things. I think, first of all, that you should vote. We all should vote. I think that's part of our civic duty uh, as Americans is, is that we should get out there and, and, and pull the lever for whomever we think is the, is the best person to lead the country. And, and after that, uh, after next Tuesday, I think it's very important that all of us support whoever the president is. I mean, after this Tuesday's election, um, in all likelihood, it's going to be one of two candidates, of course, the Democrat or the Republican candidate. Um, and in this election, unlike most others in any of our recent memories, there's been a lot of demonization of the other side by one side. And I think that, you know, on either side of this, on whoever you vote for, on either side of it, you're gonna think on Tuesday, some of us are gonna think that the person who is going to be president is going to do tremendous harm to the republic and be the worst thing that ever happened to the country. Well, right. be that as it may, we need to, I think, accept it. We need to swallow those emotions because what makes this country great and what makes our system work is coming together. The, the peaceful transfer of power and the ability for people to, to come together after elections and, and work together to make the country work. And I think that if we don't do that, and there's been a lot of chatter on both sides, again, about resistance to whomever becomes president. I don't think we can do that. I mean, you know, short of indictments and, and things coming out that prove that the person who is elected shouldn't be president and then there's constitutional uh, things that take care of that, if that does happen, we have to support the person. We have to support that person. And, and this chatter about not supporting them, I think is terrible. I think that we all should vote. We all should support the person that's president after that and, and move on from there. I think it's very, very important. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah keep, you, you, you gotta keep in mind that the person who wins got there from a majority of of the, the voters. voters. Yep, yep. So, you know, you, you can't dismiss half of the United States because you don't happen to like the person who got in, into office. You've right. got to go, well, okay. Yeah. Um, I think what you've got to do is you've got to question why did that person get there? Yeah, right. And, and why, why was uh, my own personal ideas or my own personal party, why did they not make it? Convince, because I think there's lots of people. Yeah. yeah, and I think it, it, it depends on, you know, I mean, you've you got to look at that and you've got to understand, well, okay, maybe, maybe change is needed. Well, yeah, and very possibly. And I think yeah. that, you know, the other thing is that this idea, I just said that this is this has been an election that's been unprecedented. Oh, boy. It's been unprecedented in our lifetimes. But I yeah. mean, if you go back in history, as you know, I love to do, I mean, in 1800, I mean, you know, opponents of John Adams called him a hermaphrodite. I mean, he was accused <laughs> of being a hermaphrodite in the newspapers. I mean, that wasn't true, you know? I mean, opponents of, of Thomas Jefferson accused him of having relations with one of his slaves and having children by her. 
that apparently was true. Uh, okay. <laughs> but you know, I mean, there's been some dirty elections. Yeah. There's been some some mud slung for years. I mean, Andrew Jackson was accused of being a being a slave trader and being a duelist and a murderer, most of which was true. I mean, you know, these things happen over the course of time where you, know, you hope that the discourse gets more evolved and, and gets more peaceable and that better people come up to, to be elected. And you know, again, we all have a choice. We're all gonna pull our lever on Tuesday, hopefully. And, and I think that we just have to live with what happens and we have to agree to agree to disagree. We're not gonna stop disagreeing after right. after November 8th, but, but agree to disagree in the right way. I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, just coincidentally, I'm driving to work this morning and I hear uh, there's a program I listen to, to called, or a segment of uh, NPR called StoryCorps, which mm -hmm. is really just, uh, it's a project that records personal conversations between family members or friends or sometimes mentors and mentees, teacher and student, whatever. And these are very personal conversations where they relate some sort of event or, or topic in their mm -hmm. life. This one, coincidentally this morning, happened to be between a father and a daughter whose relationship has become very strained mm. over the last few, and actually over several years, but just because politically they are on opposite sides of the fence, and, and particularly with this election, have gotten pretty rancorous. So they came together and they recorded kind of their feelings and where they're going out. And they learned some things about each other when they did mm -hmm. that discussion is that, well, you know what? They still love each other. Right. They still respect each other's opinion, even if they completely disagree. Mm -hmm. And it was, I, I think it's an important, and I encourage, I matter of fact, I link to it. If you go out to the player mm -hmm. page and you look underneath, you'll see a link. It's the very last link down there that goes out to StoryCorps. Uh, there's an audio recording as well as a transcript. It's three minutes long. I encourage you to look at it because I think it really puts everything in perspective. Like you said, once it's all over and done, we gotta get back to, to life as usual. Yeah. We gotta be friends. We gotta be family members. Yeah. We gotta put it behind us and just say, okay, well, okay, you won. I lost. Okay. We're all still Americans. We're we all still love Americans. each other, hopefully. Yep. There you go. And, and move on. And I think that's really, really important. And we have to heal from that because uh, it's, been, it's been pretty rancorous, but I think that we can, that's we right. can definitely move on. Okay. Well, get out and vote. That's uh, right. You, if you got early voting, well, get in there early or go out there November 8th and vote. And uh, we will see you next Friday. <laughs> rain, rain or shine. I'm sure the United States won't fall off into the, you know, in the Atlantic and the That's Pacific right. Oceans. That's Just, right. Yeah. So we'll, 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 we'll still be here. Thanks again, Rob Bellinger, for being here yeah. and, and Olympus for, yeah. for a great Tech Corner. You will all have a great weekend. Again, vote next Tuesday. Uh, we'll see you next week here on Quality Digest Live. That's right. So long. Bye. Actually, it was good because we, I didn't.